Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, this very exciting event, and we're so pleased to have uh, Sue May with us today. Um, it's a real privilege to have her come and talk to us, and um, any of you who've uh, seen her speak or uh, know her will realise that she'll have lots of great and insightful things to say today. So let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm Shanti Flynn. I'm the um, HR uh, committee chair um, and just hosting this event in conjunction with the Women of Influence Committee. So Jennifer will be uh, talking to you later and helping to construct the Q&A uh, with Sue May. But first of all, I just want to um, uh, do a brief introduction. I'm the managing director of S. Flynn Consulting. Um, I've got 28 years in corporate HR roles, including nearly five years with Walmart as their SVP for the Asia region and Ford Motor Company and Boots and lots of others. So now leveraging that experience into, uh, into other areas. So um, if any of you are interested in strategic leadership consulting, then that's my kind of sphere. Um, for those of you who are not members, there is uh, an opportunity to join the American Chamber um, as individuals or as corporate members, and then you can have concessions on attending events like these. The HR committee will generally run uh, a couple of these sorts of events targeted um, at trying to add value to not only the business community, the HR community, the service community, but to really improve the knowledge and understanding of HR. Um, I'm going to just ask if you can be respectful um, to Sue May with your phones, if you can turn them onto silent mode and eliminate bleeping and beeping and ringing, that would be great. And if you need to take a call, if you can take it outside. Um, and I'd just like to also um, uh, just give you a very brief introduction. I think Sue, will, Sue May will also uh, talk a bit about her background. No, not at all. I'm not at all. OK. So I'm going to just say that, obviously, as, um, She's the CEO of the Women's Foundation, which is an NGO. Many of you may well be familiar with their great work that they do with many women. How many, how many people are on your books now, Sumay? Gosh, well, it won't seem to compute, so our, our last year's number touches 8,000. 8,000. 8,000 right. So, we've had 600 women go through our mentoring program. So, a huge reach, um, not only for professional uh, women, but also that interesting uh, blend with how do, how do women and men operate in a more effective way. So it's not just aimed entirely at growing women, it's very much about how do we operate more effectively together. She has got just almost too much to mention in terms of the roles that she has. She sits on the board of the Hong Kong Opera, she plays the piano, she's on the Council of Cheltenham Ladies College. I'm not making any of this up, by the way. She's done a TED talk. Um, she's got degrees from Cambridge and Oxford in law. She's got um, a very extensive career with Walt Disney, Christie's. Um, and so, I mean, you can read it from her resume, so I'm not going to read it all out. But I just wanted to, to share with you the, the fact that she's got, in her, in her very tender years, has managed to achieve quite a lot. Um, so um, I, I think I'm going to hand over to you, Sue May, so I don't dominate this conversation. And looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Keep it controversial. Thank you so much, Shanti. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, it does feel like summer has arrived, hasn't it? Yeah. So at the Women's Foundation, we work with a range of corporate partners at different stages of tackling diversity issues within their organizations. Um, and when a company starts to review and discuss how many women are employed in the business and other diversity issues, you can be sure that there are employees who harbor reservations about the discussion, what's being proposed. But often these don't surface in open discussion because people are worried about being seen as not politically correct. But I think it's really important that these reservations are surfaced and discussed because otherwise they can end up eroding the effectiveness of any attempts that the company is making to drive change. So we, th we always say it's better to call out the elephants in the room and my talk today is essentially about this. Um, we've come up with 
seven elephants in the room or seven views which employees and stakeholders in a business might quite reasonably hold but prefer to hide. Um, and that we think that it's important that the leadership and HR professionals address openly. So the first thing that people might be thinking is, you know, we're doing okay the way we are, and I'm worried that all this talk about diversity is going to force us to compromise on quality. And that is going to put us on the road to mediocrity. A second thing that people might be thinking is, well, actually, you know, we may not do so well with women, but we've got lots of racial and cultural diversity. You know, how much diversity is, in, is, is needed? You know, isn't that enough? Um, another speech bubble um, over people's heads might be, we really hope that we're not going to go down the road of quotas and targets like some other companies have. A fourth elephant could be, particularly for male-dominated sectors, we're in industries that traditionally haven't appealed to women. It's not that we're actively discriminating against women, it's just that they're not interested in working here in the first place. Somewhat related to this, a fifth view that people might hold is, hang on a minute, wasn't it Sheryl Sandberg who said that women need to lean in? And it sounds like there's a lack of women in senior roles everywhere because women aren't assertive enough, they don't speak up, they're not putting up their hand for promotions and stretch assignments. Number six, this unconscious bias training that we've been threatened with sounds like consultant gobbledygook and a bit of a waste of time. To paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, people know what they know and they don't know what they don't know. Can you really train people to know what they don't know? And finally, number seven, if we start to focus on women at our organizations, isn't that reverse discrimination against men? Aren't we going to just end up with a lot of hacked off, demotivated guys? So those are the seven elephants that I'm going to try and tackle. Um, you may have more, um, in which case, you know, I'd love to hear about them in the Q&A. Um, so, you know, I know the plan is to have a Q&A. You know, if at any time, though, during my talk, you want to make a observation or ask a question, you know, please feel free. It'd be great to make this as interactive as possible. Um, but kicking off, okay, so the first elephant and the concern that diversity means compromising on quality and leads to mediocrity. So a common argument against pushing for greater diversity is that it will lower standards, raising the specter of a diverse but more mediocre group. And in some quarters, there really does remain this pervasive myth that to be inclusive is to be accepting of mediocrity. Now, a good illustration, I think, of this is what happened to Julia Pearson. She was the first female US Secret Service director who President Obama apparently appointed in response to criticism um, that his administration lacked diversity. So 18 months after her appointment, she was forced to resign after a spate of security breaches around the White House, including, you remember this um, episode of a guy who scaled the White House wall and made it into um, the executive mansion with a knife. But a lot of the comments that followed was on the lines of, well, this is what happens when you try to be politically correct and appoint a woman for a role that actually women are not suitable for. Never mind that the director that she had replaced in the role was a man who was fired because of a prostitution scandal um, involving Secret Service agents and officers that occurred under his watch. Somehow, his failings did not start a national conversation about whether or not we should reevaluate men's inherent competencies and leadership skills. You know, the fact is that both men and women can be terrible at their jobs. But when a woman fails, as a society, we have a tendency to let that become a reason to second guess all women. Some of you may have seen a comic called How It Works. So if you can picture two panels, in the first panel, there are two men standing at a whiteboard. And one man has written an incorrect answer to a maths problem. And the other man says, wow, you suck at maths. Now, this second panel shows a woman and a man standing at the whiteboard. 
and the woman has written the incorrect answer. And the man, um, this time the, the speaker says, wow, girls really suck at maths. You spot the difference. So I want to make it clear I don't think for one moment that diversity should ever be a goal unto itself. No one should get a gold star just for showing up. And it isn't the case that diversity automatically results in something better. You, you have to have diversity and performance. But the point is that diversity can be an avenue to performance. Now, we know that organizations are complex and the problems they face are diverse which suggests, I think, that a diverse and competent workforce is required to face the challenges. But real inclusion means insisting on excellence. It's about refusing to accept patchy recruitment processes that fail to reach out to the best talent available. It demands that leaders get the very best out of most and not just some people within the organization. It drives performance by creating highly efficient and effective working environments. So if we settle for a status quo that only allows a few to be truly successful, then I think the loss is everyone's, individual, organizational, and societal. So moving on to elephant number two, which is how much diversity does one company need? If you already have racial and cultural diversity, you know, how much focus do you need to put on other forms of diversity? So this isn't an easy question, and it doesn't have an easy answer. I don't think the right answer to how much diversity is enough is a target number, nor is the right answer necessarily that the extent of diversity should directly reflect the makeup of your customer base, which is one view that some companies take. I think every company needs to decide for itself the answer to this question, depending on its particular set of circumstances. But you can only make, I think, that determination through an inclusive dialogue that people aren't afraid to engage in. My own view is that you probably have enough diversity when it no longer feels like a sensitive subject. Individuals within the business feel empowered to share their views and opinions about diversity when it's such a normal occurrence that you don't have to ask how much diversity is enough. And if you think about it, actually achieving diversity and a rainbow-looking organization is not that hard. What is much more difficult is to instill a culture of inclusion. It's a culture of inclusion that will stop your employees of a particular ethnicity only hanging out with each other at work. It's a culture of inclusion that will empower the women in the business to speak up at meetings. Without that culture of inclusion, your ethnic minority employees may be sticking together out of fear rather than comfort. Your women may not be speaking up because they don't feel their opinions are valued or respected. And this is really important because on its own, diversity does not make for a cohesive community. Recent studies from Harvard, from Michigan State University have found that diversity actually means less sense of community. Basically, the more diverse a community is, the less socially inclusive it is, while the more homogenous a community is, the more socially inclusive it is. So this, these studies found that more diverse communities tend to distrust their neighbors, to expect the worst from the community and its leaders, to register to vote less, to give less to charity, and to hunker down a lot more in front of the TV. So accordingly, Many companies, I think, have come to realize that you need to put as much effort into managing the uniqueness of a diverse environment as you do into creating it in the first place. And how do you do that? Well, you can start by running an employee survey um, to identify the issues that employees are having and what they feel about the firm's processes and culture. Um, secondly, minority groups within an organization need advocates. Too often there are rooms full of people making decisions about employees that they don't really know that much about. By having a cross-section of representatives engaged in formulating HR policies and practices, communicating employees' needs and issues, I think the chance then of implementing off-based or misguided policies and initiatives decreases. 
you take the example of Xerox, which has had a diversity program for more than 40 years. Is anyone here from Xerox? Let me speak for them. Managers are assessed on whether they are contributing to the firm's progress towards greater diversity. There are diversity training programs for new employees. Xerox has six officially recognized employee caucus groups, including ones for black employees, women, Hispanics, Asians, gay and lesbian workers, which function as independent nonprofit groups that perform charity work, but they're also in regular communication with senior executives to discuss potential workplace issues. Separately, on top of this, there are social networking groups for young professionals, for female engineers, and very notably, Xerox has a black female chair and CEO, Ursula Burns. She's the first Afro-American to lead um, a Fortune 500 company, and her predecessor at Xerox, Anne Mulcahy, was also a woman. Elephant number three. When you try and identify how much diversity is optimal, once you've done that and you realize what a gap there is, should firms introduce quotas or targets? And this is a very hot topic, of course, in the context of women on boards, with a number of European countries having recently introduced quotas mandating a certain percentage of women directors on listed company boards. Now, the arguments against quotas are that it leads to box ticking, um, with new female directors not being appointed on merit. Um, and secondly, that introducing a quota undermines the achievements of the successful minority who have risen to senior positions on their own merit. Against this, you have the repost that many men currently holding board positions weren't selected on merit either. Um, but precisely because they were men and they were members of an old boys network that still strongly influences board appointments today, although I think things are getting better on this front, particularly in the UK. When Mervis, Mervyn Davis was preparing the Davis Report on Women and Boards in the UK in 2011, he discovered that fewer than 4% of all board appointments in the UK were being filled through executive search. So how are they being filled? Um, some of you may be familiar with the 30% Club in the UK, founded by Helena Morrissey, has a strong support of <coughs> of um, lots of, of, of chairmen. Um, back in 2013, um, at the Women's Foundation, we founded the 30% Club Hong Kong. And like the UK, we are a group of chairmen and CEOs committed to bringing more women onto corporate boards. But despite our name, we are not about quotas. Rather, we encourage businesses to set their own aspirational voluntary targets um, and the time frame for reaching them based on their particular circumstances. But we really do think that cr targets are critical because what gets measured gets done. And there's a recent report by McKinsey which shows that companies with a fact-based understanding of their female metrics are 2.4 times more likely to transform their businesses. So elephant number four. If you're in a male-dominated sector in an industry that hasn't traditionally appealed to women, um, perhaps it's not that we're actively excluding women, it's just that they're not interested in working here. So yes, it is true, I think, that many women are deterred from working in traditionally male-dominated industries, ask Sean from her years at, at Ford, um, because of the lack of female role models, stereotypes, the nature of women's work. According to the Harvard Implicit Association Tests, more than 70% of test takers today still associate men with science and, and women with arts. But even girls who pursue STEM subjects at school or university aren't choosing to apply for roles within male-dominated industries, in part because of perceptions that their masculine or blokey workplace cultures have a higher tolerance of behaviors that border on sexual harassment, bullying, or discrimination, and of course, there are often also structural issues like long hours, remote locations, and other non-family friendly features. But I think the impetus for change is growing on the back of existing and projected skills shortages and new ideas and approaches that are being adopted to attract, retain, and promote more women. So for example, when it comes to attracting female applicants 
organizations like IBM, like BHP Billiton, to name but two, are implementing strategies to address the negative perceptions that women hold about their industries, are actively promoting the benefits and career opportunities within their sectors. So these include using diverse images, inclusive language in job ads to attract more women, engaging with universities to provide careers guidance and internships for female undergraduates, publishing profiles and case studies of women in non-traditional roles, sponsoring external awards organizations to enhance their profile and create a brand proposition that is more attractive to women. When it comes to recruitment strategies, organizations like HSBC and BP are broadening the capabilities that they're looking for to increase the pool of potential candidates. They're establishing inclusive and rigorous interview and selection methods which are based on genuine meritocracy. So th these could include ensuring that recruiting teams comprise men and women, or offering women the opportunity to display their skills through a job trial or a practical demo during the recruitment process instead of relying solely on an interview question um, basis. Also supporting women to move to a frontline role after spending time in a support function, often where women start. So I think it is not good enough to fall back on the excuse anymore that you're in a male-dominated industry. Um, you may have to work a bit harder, but there is no reason if you do that you can't attract, retain, and promote more women. So our fifth elephant was Sheryl Sandberg, um, COO, of course, of Facebook, who authored um, Lean In. I'm sure everyone's read it. Has some of you read Lean In? Great. Um, or to give it its full title, Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead. Um, and this question whether the real reason there's a lack of women in senior management is because women aren't being assertive, not putting their hands up for promotions and stretch assignments. I think the answer is that this is only part of the reason. Um, it's also true that companies need to, to acknowledge that women are often less explicit about their ambitions many women feel conflicted between motherhood and a career. And it is obviously a personal choice whether women decide to stay in the workforce after they have children. But I do think employers can do much more to help women combine working with being a mum. Of course, lots of companies have recognized this, and they are offering part-time work, flexible working, aided by advances in technology. But changing the mindset of employers and employees, particularly those working at small and medium-sized enterprises, to view maternity leave or flexible working positively is arguably a more important yet difficult achievement. In many cases still, part-time workers are seen as lacking in ambition. Part-time has honestly assumed pejorative connotations in many cases because it seems to imply a half-hearted commitment. And I think we, many of us, I certainly have been guilty myself of rolling my eyes when I hear that a woman who's just come back from maternity leave is pregnant again and about to depart for another period of paid leave. But when someone opts for part-time or goes for maternity leave, we need to reposition this as an opportunity for other colleagues to take on new, expanded responsibilities, allowing for enhanced professional, personal development. More organizations now are using coaches to help employees and managers of employees going on maternity leave to make that transition more positively and to help them re-engage with stakeholders, key clients on their return and to explore different childcare options and alternative work patterns. And this is the smart thing to do because guess what? Women who are treated well, who feel they can build a career build a family at the same time, tend to stay put. They're loyal, they're grateful, and they serve as powerful role models, and they become some of the firm's biggest assets. So this is what happened at ICICI Bank in India, which has launched the careers of 14 of India's top female finance professionals. And I remember meeting ICICI's former CEO, Baman Kamath, in 2004, when I was running the FT in Asia. And he told me the story that when ICICI started, they couldn't re 
they couldn't recruit all the male hotshots leaving the top Indian business schools because they all wanted to go and work for international big brands. So ICICI decided to focus on female talent and to make sure that female talent knew that the bank would support them in their careers and their family life. So in 2009, when Vernath moved up to become chairman, he was succeeded as CEO by a woman, Chanda Kocha, who has worked at the bank for 25 years and had taken two extended periods of maternity leave. So let's uh, move on to elephant number six, which may be a bit controversial. Um, and the question here is whether you can train people to be conscious about their unconscious biases. So at the same time as companies are jumping on the bandwagon in droves and introducing diversity training for their board members, their managers, their staff, a wave of studies are starting to emerge which purport to show that diversity training doesn't actually work. Um, now, for those of you who aren't all that familiar with diversity programs, so, you know, the most basic programs largely provide guidance for employees on things they can say and they can't say. Um, and more advanced programs might take a group of employees and ask them to separate themselves into categories. Um, you know, some of the categories might be more self-evident, like gender, age, ethnicity. Other categories might be more subtle, like likes or dislikes and beliefs. And then each group is then asked to explain how they see themselves in an attempt to educate others on what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. <coughs> so why is it that researchers are asserting that despite the millions of dollars being spent now on diversity training, um, these programs generally have no positive lasting effects in the average workplace? Well, social psychologists have many theories to explain why diversity training does not work as intended. Some researchers see evidence of such strong stereotypes, biases that are so deeply ingrained that a one-day workshop just can't reverse them. Um, other psychologists argue that, ironically, diversity training doesn't extinguish prejudice. It ends up amplifying it because when people divide into those categories to illustrate the idea of diversity it actually ends up reinforcing the categories um, in people's minds so on the other hand of course diversity consultants will insist the training they provide does deliver value so who's right and who's wrong well in my experience i think it is actually generally better not to focus on categories but on individuals because people aren't prejudiced generally against real people, they're prejudiced against categories. So you might hear people say, well, okay, John is gay, but he's not like other gay people. So you know, we need to stop seeing people as categories, but to see people as people. Um, and training people to be accepting of diversity is often, I think, just too conceptual and, and doesn't work. I think instead it's better to train people on how to manage a diverse set of individuals um, to train managers to focus on the singularity of each of their direct reports and how to bring out the best in them. Training people to listen and speak to each other, I think, is really the key to creating a vibrant and inclusive environment. But in practice, though, a diversity program on its own, no matter how well designed and how well taught, um, isn't enough. So most companies find that it's a multi-pronged approach that leads to results. GE initiated an aggressive diversity strategy under Jack Welch that included employee networks, formal mentoring, recruiting at colleges popular with minorities, the appointment of a chief diversity officer. So in the year 2000, women, minorities, and non-US citizens made up 22% of GE's officers and 29% of senior executives. By 2005, their ranks had risen to 34% of officers and 40% of senior executives. In other companies, the two factors that have been found to be critical to success are first, having that someone responsible for overseeing diversity, and secondly, mentoring, particularly for younger women. So, on to our seventh and final elephant, 
which was, if we really start to pump up the volume around women at our organization, isn't that reverse discrimination against men? Don't we risk ending up with a lot of demotivated guys? Okay, well, I think there are several points that can be made here. Um, one is that companies can avoid this kind of backlash by taking care to position family-friendly workplace policies as available to both men and women, reframing maternity and paternity leave as parental leave, making it a gender-neutral issue also recognizes that more men want to be actively involved with their families. When Sheryl Sandberg says in Lean In that the most important career decision a woman can make is her choice of partner or spouse, and she's echoing something that we've said all along at the Women's Foundation, which is that we won't get greater gender equality in the workplace until we get greater gender equality at home. And we need to become a society that celebrates and supports both men and women as earners and carers, and prepares boys and girls for a future shared role in caring for children. And um, I'd like to just tell the story of how we brought Adrian Burgess of the Fatherhood Institute in the UK over to, to Hong Kong to give some talks. And she said, well, what title, Sume, shall I use for my talks? I can either go with active fathering makes for happier kids or active fathering makes for smarter kids. Well, I think you can probably guess which one we went for in Hong Kong's competitive environment. I can tell you that every single one of her talks was oversubscribed, mainly by dads. So related to this, of course, we're seeing more and more men joining the UN's He for She movement, the bandwagon of male leaders who are speaking out in support of a more gender equal world. Um, it seems sometimes that men are actually coming out as the new feminists. And I think they're doing this because um, they believe in the business case, that having more women around the table makes for better business decisions, um, a greater affinity with your customer base, um, and better results. Um, they realize that to be competitive, countries and companies can't afford to squander the contribution of one half of the talent pool. Interestingly, a recent study by Catalyst examined the presumption that male leaders who speak up for women do it because they have daughters. Um, but the study actually found that this was not the case. Um, it seems that male advocates are male advocates because of a deep commitment to justice and fair play. But whatever the reason, the good news is, I think, that in the interplanetary order of things, it appears that Mars and Venus are moving closer together. And this can only be a good thing. So I've now spoken for really quite a long time, um, and you'll be relieved to hear, I'm sure, that those are my concluding remarks. Um, you know, I hope you found my talk useful. I'd be delighted, of course, to answer any questions, and I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts and views on everything I've talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Sume. Um, my name is Jennifer Parks. I'm the co-chair of the Women of Influence Committee here at AmCham. I'm the COO, regional COO for uh, White and Case, a law firm here um, in Asia and a mentor currently under the Women's Foundation, um, which I can talk about later if anybody's interested in it. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions now. We have a, a microphone that we'd like to use because we're recording the event. So does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask Sume? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. And please, when you, um, when you stand up and uh, ask your question, uh, give your name and your affiliation. Uh, hi, Sume. Great to see you. My name is Felicity, Felicity McCrobb. I'm with uh, Insignium. Um, Sume, as I've taken the microphone, I'm not so sure if I have a question or, or something I wanted to pose, if that's okay to be straight about it. Um, one of the things, like Simon C. Mac, you know, who's one of uh, a great speaker right now, um, but he talks about something called the golden circle. So he talks about three things. He talks about the why, he talks about the how, and he talks about the what. And his point is, very simple, is that mostly we talk about the what and the how, the what we do and how we do it, but really great leadership is organized around the, the why. And so I think this was a point I wanted to explore with you, is, um, I, you know, there's a lot of tactical things, right? What we should do, what we shouldn't do, how many, when, where, etc. But I don't hear a lot about the why, right? And the why is, what's the purpose of including women and minorities in organizations? or just not simply in organizations, societally, right? You know, what are we in service of? What gets provided, what gets made possible when that's the case, when it hasn't been the case 
and, and in, the, in the developing world for, for 5,000 years, right? So I just wanted to hear, you know, what resonates with you? Because um, clearly you've devoted your life to making this possible in the Hong Kong community and outside of the Hong Kong community. And I'd be really interested to hear, you know, if you could share with us why. What's the purpose? What are you in service of? Because I know you had a tremendous career before you took on this career. So what is it about that that had you, um, that had you change what you did to make the kind of contribution that you can? Kind of you've listed to, you know, to kind of reference it back to me. Um, what we do at the Women's Foundation is 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 you know, motivated from, you know, seeing what happens when, you know, really from the perspective of women, um, you know, they they gain in confidence, they gain, um, uh, they feel that they can reach for more, and we see what happens when, you know, they really start to believe they can walk through any door, sit at any table, have any job and have any life they want. Um, but that's not the same um, answer, I suppose, that, you know, from the perspective of companies or organizations, why they should be um, really looking to ensure that women aren't being held back. You know, there are lots of, I think, you know, very good, the, the business case, I, I, I hope, has been made. And I'm very interested to hear from other people in the room as to whether they feel that that business case you know, still has to be made in the organizations that they represent. Yeah, I think from the stats. Right. Uh, hi, my name's Andrew Simmons. I uh, work for Harvey Nash. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure the business case does have to be made. I think uh, there's so many stats out there. Um, there's been so many studies done. There's been so many reports written. I think, I, I, I think certainly from my perspective, we've moved on from that uh, nowadays as well. I think occasionally, yeah, right, it needs to be reinforced. Um, but I think it, it needs to move on somewhat. Um, and just for the record, I am, I think, the only male in here today. Um, but one of the things I look out for when I come to these events are um, how many men uh, actually attend. I think the He for She uh, campaign, which I was in this room about a couple of weeks ago, I think there were quite a lot of men. There were two men speaking that day, and I'm assuming they asked other men to come. Um, but one of the things that I think we need to focus on is getting more, more men involved in the conversation, uh, certainly things like this. I think many people in this room know the things that have been discussed today, I think we hear time and time again. I think it's now making sure that um, we're all responsible, each and every one of us, for bringing a male colleague, male friend, male partner, somebody we've got a relationship with, into the room. So actually, rather than just the stats um, and making the business case, it's actually about getting more people involved in it. Um, Andrew, that's a good point. Um, and so a Andrew's the only male in the room, but we also we all have colleagues, male colleagues. We all have husbands, family members who are men. So Sume, this question's for you: Is how um, how can uh, men who want to become male champions how can they get started? Um, I think a good place to get started is actually to arm yourself with the stats, right? So to look at how um, the how your company or um, your division is doing vis-a-vis -vis kind of um, market benchmarks. Um, and, you know, really, I think with, with the numbers, you know, numbers that gives kind of an evidence-based um, argument to, you know, the, the point that actually, you know, maybe more effort is required to, um, to ensure that women come into the workforce and, and then are staying and then being promoted. So I think, my advice would be, you know, arm yourself with the data. Um, and then, you know, other ways that men can help, um, you know, it's uh, ensuring that, you know, within their teams, I think, um, you know, so not to do, go too far, but ensuring that women get recognition um, and, um, you know, that, um, and also encouraging women to take the, the stretch assignments and, and so on. And I think what, what we've found is that um, women... Yeah, I think you all know this. Right? Women only apply for a job or a position when they can fulfil, you know, one hundred and fifty percent of the requirements, and men will do it at about twenty-five. Maybe that's unfair. Thirty, um, and uh, I think you know, then a male manager really has it within his gift to say to a woman who's tentative about something, "Well, look, okay, let's sit down, let's break this down into kind of bite-sized chunks. You know, you know, let's get to here first, and then here, and then here, right?" But it takes that extra effort, really. But you know, knowing that the potential is there, and then really nurturing that. You know, whether you're a male or a female manager, actually, 
know, I think, you know, we, we can all do much more to be, you know, just much more uh, closely helping, right, women to feel more confident and that they can reach the stars. My career and uh, uh, part of part of the the thing that we all need, if you do aspire, is often supportive husbands. And if you if you got two travelling or two big jobs in a couple with young children, sometimes that dynamic is difficult to manage. So, do you have any words of wisdom about how women manage the men in their lives to achieve that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky I've got a, a very supportive husband who happens to be a teacher. He had six weeks holiday and he used to have the kids in the summer. Um, so I could travel for my work, but not everyone has that kind of dynamic. So any thoughts on that one? Yeah. I, I think if I just look about my own situation, I have a very supportive husband too. But um, particularly of our, our first daughter, um, you know, I wouldn't let him near her, right? I mean, literally, I didn't help myself because I was so critical every time he tried to bathe her or change a nappy or something. And I was, you know, so I think women need, I think, to also encourage and be, um, you know, to, to know when they're, you know, being, I think, you know, too intense, I think, about it and, and to really give their husbands or partners permission to be equal partners at home. Uh, there's, a, there's this wonderful story of a M M Morgan Stanley male executive. I remember he said this in Morgan Stanley, kind of quite, quite public events. I'm sure he won't mind me repeating the story now, but he described the story of how when their um, infant daughter um, uh, was you know, recently born, she would, she would wake up in the middle of the night and cry. And you know, his wife would always get up and, and go and, and deal with her. And he said, no, 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 please let me. And she said, no, no, no you, you'll never be able to put her back to sleep. You know, no. So he decided um, that he would get up and, and race her to the baby, right? And be the first one there to pick her up. So this is what happened. So one night, and baby, you know, next night, baby cries. He like, you know, elbows his wife out of the way, you know, gets to the baby first, picks her up. And yes, it takes hours, literally hours longer than his wife to settle her. But you know, he gets there at the end. And then he does this repeatedly for the next four, five, six, seven nights. And on the eighth night, when the baby wakes up, she goes, apparently, she goes, Daddy, not Mummy. <laughs> right? And you know, he just, yes. <laughs> but you know, I think we all have a little bit of a tendency of this as moms. I don't know. Do I see some nods? <laughs> Another question? Hi, that was wonderful. Um, my name is Sophie Guerin with Community Business. I have a question for you about, you had mentioned just about quotas or targets, and I'm so glad that you had, had raised that as a point. One of the things that I've certainly heard growing, especially in the financial services industry, where um, you know, with companies wanting to embed diversity programs into their companies. You see some companies tying maybe 5% of their bonuses to achieving diversity targets. And I think in Asia, when I mention that to companies, there's this, oh, really, we can do that? That's really great. Um, but there's now starting to be a pushback, I'm starting to see, of companies stepping back from that as a program, so no longer tying 5% of bonuses to achieving diversity targets. And I wonder what, what's your point of view on tying bonuses and achieving targets, and do you think that's the right way to go, or do you think that, you know, what kind of incentives can we put around targets to actually make it meaningful within a company? I think, um, uh, it, some, of, some of that, um, uh, I think companies are reviewing how they can really embed um, this kind of culture of inclusion that I talked about. Because I think, you know, actually achieving a rainbow looking organization is not that hard, right? I mean, should someone really get a reward because, you know, they've managed to hire, you know, kind of multiracial, you know, bunch of people and, and that's it. I mean, you've got to go a little bit further than that. So I think you know, there's this recognition that diversity cannot be a goal unto itself, right? It's really about changing mindsets um, and, and, and really um, uh, encouraging much more meaningful teamwork. So you know, I think 
that is where some of that is coming from. Um, I've also spoken to a number of people who have those diversity targets within their um, uh, metrics range. And they, as individuals, are very uncomfortable about it because they never want to be seen as having promoted someone just so that they could benefit um, you know, with getting their bonus. So I think it, it's, it's complicated, um, actually, and you know, it's quite right, I think, that com companies stop and, and really review this and think it through. Um, instead of a kind of a knee-jerk reaction that, you know, if we stick, you know, these senior managers with 5% of their bonus tied to this, then we've solved this. Because I think they're re realizing it's not enough. It's too simplistic. Any other questions? My name is Amélie Dion Charret. I am a Canadian lawyer specialized in medical law. I'm now an entrepreneur here in Hong Kong. I have my own business and I provide healthcare concierge services and health insurance advice to individuals and companies. I've been in Hong Kong for two years. I have a small daughter, two years and a half, and I never would have been able to accomplish what I've done in Hong Kong if I didn't have a helper at home. So before moving to Hong Kong, I lived in New York. Previously to that, I lived in Canada, and my husband is French. So I have a global view of what it would have been possible for me in terms of having help at home, a nanny or, or someone else. And my question to you is, do you think Hong Kong is a different place in the world where we have a different perception of women at work because help at home is so affordable and accessible to other areas of the world? So is it different for women? And my perspective is that I, ha I know a lot more women that work here in Hong Kong because they're able to work and it's easier. On the other hand, I don't think that men's views are as progressive as they would be in Canada or in France when there's not help at home. Yeah, no, I think you summed it up, actually. I mean, I think, you know, uh, having the availability of affordable help is a great boon to professional women. Um, but, you know, I think largely male um, kind of stereotypes about, you know, women's role and so on, right, continue to hold women back. <laughs> what does everybody else think? I think. <laughs> school. So my my kids were at school and they're changing uniforms. So he stood in a queue where it was predominantly women who were queuing up for uniforms, and he was getting looks. He also had to pick up my daughter, one of my daughters, from a party, and when they realised that it was my husband taking the kids home, she said, "It's okay. I'll make other arrangements." They didn't trust him, even though he's a teacher, to, to take the, their child home, you know. So I think there's a, there is a lot of discrimination that actually creates a dynamic that's not terribly helpful for anyone, including professional women, but also in, and men who want to be more family orientated. So I think that we sometimes we can tend to be under but I think that discrimination piece, sort of those, those I think that, um, that the domestic helper help that we have is wonderful, but it can only get us to a certain extent. Um, and you know, if you think about the demographics that are you know, changing quite rapidly now, not just for Hong Kong, but other, other Asian countries and actually in other parts of the world too, you know, we're going to have um, an elderly generation that is going to be living much, much longer. Um, and um, uh, so my, my helpers now currently um, help a little bit um, with my mother who at 84 um, you know, is still quite mobile and, and you know, full of beans and you know, has all her mental faculties and everything else. But you know, as I kind of play that forward, um, I think you know, what she re is really going to want is more quality time with family members um, and you know, how we think about how we're going to care for our elderly relatives, right, who are going, uh, you know, basically going to be quite lonely. Um, I think, you know, the, the domestic help can only take you so far. So um, that's just, I think, another consideration for, I think, many, many women here. 
Hello, I'm Katie from Superstyle Asia. I founded a company to help predominantly women improve their confidence and communication. And what I find, bringing it back to the Hong Kong situation, is that often it's very cultural. And I, for example, was coaching a lady lawyer who had her shoulders very much turned in. And I said, well, first thing you need to do is roll your shoulders back and down and feel more confident and look more confident. And she said, I couldn't possibly do that because women aren't meant to, you know, stick their chest out and seem, you know, too gregarious and outgoing. And obviously she was born in Hong Kong. And so I want to ask you, how do you... What's your advice for women in a cultural context of Hong Kong? Is it going to just get better with every generation, or is it something people need to actively address? Because I sometimes feel that my clients feel stuck in a cultural conundrum where they want to grow, but they're not really allowed to. I, I do think it will get better with, with generational change and um, if the access that we all have through the internet and online. Um, to such a wide range now of role models. Um, you know, Sean mentioned TED Talks and, and so on. I think, you know, I see that, you know, my daughters are only nine and seven, but, you know, the things that they're accessing through the internet, you know, there's some very, very positive things as well as, you know, way too much computer games. But, um, so, you know, I do think things will change. Um, I have a question about, uh, you, okay, so you mentioned GE, you mentioned Xerox, you mentioned ICICI, I think. Um, uh, how about Hong Kong? What are, you, are you seeing any interesting things um, that Hong Kong companies are doing to address diversity and inclusion? I don't know that any company thinks that it has got every piece of the pie kind of sorted out because, you know, it's, it's not just kind of one thing that you do. I think you know, there's a whole ecosystem that you really need to think about, a whole series of collective enablers um, to promote greater diversity and inclusion. But, um, you know, there are definitely some Hong Kong companies that are at, at best practice for, you know, come some of these pieces. Um, if I take the example of HSBC, um, and the way that um, they think about diversity on their boards. Um, so um, they're very, very systematic and rigorous about it. Um, you know, they will do a performance review. Um, they will do um, an assessment of, um, on a matrix kind of, of the, the skills they need, um, the networks they think they need to have among their board members. And they'll look at, and you know, this evolves obviously over time as the business change and, and circumstances and, and so on. So they'll look at whether they have that right makeup. Um, they'll use a, a independent firm to do that review for them. And then having done the um, analysis, they'll then go to another firm um, to recruit for those gaps. Um, so there's no kind of conflict of interest um, as well. And I really think that is best practice. Um, I, I see, um, it seems like, I, this is just my, my own opinion, but um, Tricia and I have talked about this before, so it might be her opinion too, um, that, that some of the banks um, globally tend to be some of the, are on the forefront of programs on addressing diversity, but they also have some of the toughest work conditions and, and remain kind of not very well balanced. Do you see, a, is there a disconnect between um, maybe industri at an industry level of some, um, what companies are doing to address diversity versus how they, how they actually are performing on a, in a cultural way. I, mean, I, think, I think you can't get away from the fact that um, in financial services, some other industries, there, will, there are these kind of alpha, very demanding jobs, whether you're a man or a woman, honestly. Um, and then I think, it, you know, as much as a, a company can do to make sure they've got the talent pool, um, and so on, to keep those people in those jobs really depends then on, I think, the individual circumstances. And, you know, I think in order to make sure that more women are in those roles, it, it isn't really the company's responsibility and solely after that, you know, really, it's down to the individual to find their own support network, work out their own arrangements with their spouse or partner. Um, but you know, I think you'll never get away from the fact that some of the toughest, most de demanding jobs in terms of time and travel, right, uh, will be challenging for women um, if they want to be the primary caregiver for children. Um, 
they're similar age to yours, actually. My eldest is, is, is 11. Um, I've noticed that and now I've reached an age where, I, where we've gone through a PC era. So in the UK, I remember the 80s where everything had to be politically correct. You weren't allowed to say blackboard anymore. You had to say chalkboard. And it, it kind of went, the pendulum swung in a very dramatic way. I kind of feel like that pendulum may be swinging back the other way. I don't know whether you're observing anything similar and whether there's anything we can do about it. If you look at things like music media, and you watch music videos now, I, 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 I called an MTV program where there was a, an, an African-American hip-hop artist. And, hi, hi, and the MTV program was um, this man's top ten hotties. And it was music, female artist. So he was sponsoring this. And this was on prime time. And it was his favorite 10 female artists. And as he was introducing, he had two women literally sitting at his feet. And I was thinking, really interesting imagery. And it, this kind of went away in the 90s in the UK. And it seems to be coming back, which is objectifying women as simple sex objects, really. And, it, and even very talented women like, you know, Beyonce, Beyonce and Jennifer are positioning themselves as these, these objects. Do you, do you see, have you got comments about it? Is there something we could do? Not necessarily to swing the pendulum all the way back again, but actually I think it's creating a, an odd balance at the moment. It's, it's a, uh, no, not a hobby horse. Well, just, just very briefly, um, you're, you're absolutely right. We're really concerned about this. Um, we've just done a... Um, a piece of research that looks at um, the, you know, the correlation, um, if any, between exposure to um, sexualized images of women in the media and escalating um, incidents of violence and harassment against women. And um, you know, unsurprisingly, I think you know the research shows that um, you know the boys who are exposed to um, particularly violent forms of pornography and so on, you know, have a greater pro proclivity um, to think of women as sexual prey. Um, and actually, it also works on women, because girls who are exposed to violent, demeaning images of women are much more likely to acquiesce to sexual coercion. So, you know, we are really concerned about this, and that is why, at the Women's Foundation, we are making a documentary um, called She Objects, or She Objects. Um, and it'll come out early next year, and it is looking exactly at these issues. Any questions? Anyone want to? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, Trisha Pilgrim from & Case. Um, just on from Jennifer's question about the, the alpha-dominated industries, is it therefore that you need to then put in place things more, much more so along the lines of quotas to help really like lift the, those numbers. So in places like law firms and investment banks and other places like that. I don't know that it, it is necessarily a, the, a, something that can be solved by quotas. Um, you know, I think the banks, and we mentioned them, you know, a lot of them are, you know, really thinking about this very hard. And, and I would love to have women in those roles so they could only get them to stay. Um, I think we, as a society, haven't sorted out some of the issues about, you know, within a couple, you know, if, if a woman is going to go for, you know, the ta top kind of IB job, right, what does it mean for her family? Um, and, you know, as a society, right, um, you know, are we supportive enough if her husband decides to, you know, be more of the child ca um, caregiver? So I, I'm not sure that it's necessarily quotas because I think the, the, the demand is, is there, right? And the opportunities are there. Um, it's more that I think the supply is, is, is more lacking. But then is it appropriate to have a broader conversation with up-and-coming female talent around, well, well, what support do you have at home and how can we... Like, and, and therefore, do you potentially step into areas that are currently seen as being non-PC to have a conversation about? I mean, I think, um, gosh, isn't it Google who recently offered, you know, kind of egg freezing, right, <laughs> for free for um, employees? So, I mean, I think um, employ employers, you know, who really care, I think, are having those conversations, right? You know, what can we do to support you through those early years of, you know, childcare and so on? Because we really want you to stay. 
Any other questions? I have, I have one more. Um, so we talked about, uh, you talked about lean in and how um, Cheryl Sandberg saying you know, that women should be more assertive in the careers. You gave an example, and we actually do it at our, at our firm. Um, our female associates tend to, um, they tend to write meets expectations um, on their reviews where our male, <laughs> there's a trend where our male associates are always above expectations on their reviews. Like the women are just are, are a little bit, I don't know who's more honest, <laughs> but, but there's a, a gender difference. Um, and you talked about how you can calibrate those um, or look at that um, uh, at the performance reviews. But are there, are there other things that companies can be doing to, um, to address, address this, that, that, uh, um, this issue that Cheryl talked about and um, leaned in? Leaned in? Are there other things that companies can do to help women be more assertive? Yes, I mean, a lot of companies are doing, you know, speak, speaking with confidence um, sessions, shoulders, shoulders back. We're all going to be doing that now. You know, mentoring, sponsorship. I mean, I think, um, you know, there are, there are lots of different ingredients to, to this. Um, and I think, you know, companies are starting to embrace quite a, lot, a number of these. I, we're, we, we have... So we know so many companies in Hong Kong now, and this is really, I think, very positive news for any w woman working here, um, you know, who have launched women's networks, you know, who have invested in mentoring and sponsorship programs. Um, uh, so, you know, I, th I think this is a great time to be a, a, a woman working um, in Hong Kong. Uh, I, to me, I take all of that, I, and and. And I take the, the tremendous opportunities, tremendous time to be a woman in an organization. Um, I also want to answer, maybe say something to your question, Jennifer, as well. Is I also don't want us to lose sight of that there are organizational cultures which still make it tremendously difficult, no matter how much you lean in, to actually be able to crack the code. And um, I was just thinking particularly of somebody I've worked with for many years. Uh, she's actually in the United States. And she called me up from, uh, she works in a high tech company. She's a PhD. She's just made an, a tremendous contribution to her organization. And anyhow, she called me up because she's won a national award. And um, so she could, it was late, you know, West Coast time, her time was late. She said, Felicity, are you still up? I'm so excited. It's not public. I got to tell somebody, right? I said, what happened? She said, I got a national award. I won the national award, right? And she's a woman of color. And, um, you know, it's an award for a, a tremendous technological innovation, which you will hear about, you know, maybe six months down the road. But anyhow, then she started crying. And she said, I don't know why I'm crying. I didn't call you to cry. I called you to celebrate. And then she said, I just realized why I'm crying. Because it, the struggle that I've had to get heard anywhere, I can't get above a grade nine. She can't get above a grade, a senior manager. Right? And it's wrong. It is totally wrong. And she said, I've been struggling, as you know, and my thing has been, I've always come back to it must be me. They tell me I don't communicate, right? It must be me. And she said, now I've won this award, I'm realizing it's actually not me, <laughs> right? And then, you know, so the emotion, the, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I'm sharing that because I know things are changing. And, I, you know, I can quote you also 100 incidences of even more senior women than a senior manager who was a president of an organization who got sideswiped, you know, and, and the, the impact of that in the organization is a whole other thing. But for her personally, I mean, spent 25 years getting there, right, like that. So I also want us to bear in mind that there's still more West to go. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Simei? Okay, um, I'd like to thank Sumay for your, um, your talk and then the Q&A. I think that you know, it was very interesting um, to, to, to go through the elephants, um, but it's also, I think it's equipped all of us to go and to combat them when we, are, when we see them in our, in our workplace and then we see them uh, out in the streets. And um, I'd like to thank you for that as well. Um, so thank you. Sumay, for